Okay. Today we'll start chapter seven. And the title is Survey Sampling. So there's a population of size capital N. And so the individuals in this population are measured in some way. And th this results in the following list of measurements. The first individual has measurement x1, little x1. The second individual has measurement little x2. The third one has little x3, et cetera. So what are some examples of individuals in a population? It could be this uh, university, and uh, this could be the, um, I don't know, the heights of the students in the university. So this is the height of the first student, the height of the second one, the height of the third one, et cetera. Or it could be their SAT scores. This could be the SAT score of student one, SAT score of student two, et cetera, like that. Or <clears throat> this could be a... Uh, a uh, lot of uh, M&Ms produced by, I forget who owns M&Ms. Uh, and this could be the weight of the first M&M, the weight of the second one, weight of the third one, et cetera. Or it could be the citizens of Irvine. This could be the income of the first one, income of the annual income of the second. Okay, so we always uh, measure populations like this, and then we want to uh, <coughs> draw some inferences about what these measurements might be in, in reality. And finally, one last example might be, um, this one's used every election. <coughs> these could be the, this could be uh, voter preferences. So th these could be a list of um, ones and zeros. So one would mean that uh, uh, the first individual is in favor of candidate A, a zero would mean they're in favor of candidate B, and then you'd get a bunch of zeros and ones. Or <coughs> you could have zeros and ones by splitting people into uh, two groups, maybe diabetic or non-diabetic. So this would be one if the individual one is diabetic, zero not. This would be one if the individual two is diabetic, zero if not. And so we're interested in assessing uh, some information or making some inferences about these numbers. So one uh, common summary of those numbers is the average. This is called the population mean. So in the first example, this would be the average height of a student at UCI. In the um, example about uh, whether uh, <coughs> the, these people are in favor of candidate A or not, uh, remember one showed up every time uh, the individual was in favor of candidate A, zero when they were not. This then would be the proportion of the population that's in favor of candidate A. So that's called the dichotomous case.
And in the dichotomous case, we call P this average. And that's a proportion of the population that has the property that led their, this value to be 1. So in the case of uh, uh, counting how many people are diabetic, if xi is 1 when a person is diabetic and 0 if not, this would be the portion, proportion of the population that are diabetic. <coughs> okay. um, sometimes the population total is uh, interesting. So one example might be, um, this is how many cars individual one owns. This is how many cars individual two owns. How many cars individual three owns. Mu would then be the average number of cars per individual. Or it could be households or something like that. Um, you might be interested in how many cars there are total. And this is called the population total. And this is just capital N times the population average. That's called the population total. Sometimes when assessing uh, uh, data, you might be interested also in how far, on average, <coughs> these values vary from their average value. This is called the population variance. <clears throat> this is a measure of what? It's measuring how far xi is from u squared, and then you take the average distance. In manufacturing M&Ms, you would want this to be big or small? Small, that would mean that almost all the M&Ms are the same size. If they were all exactly the same size, this would be zero. So that's true in a lot of manufacturing. You want uh, the pieces to be rather uniform. So you'd want this to be small. So this is something that uh, you may want to analyze, or you may want to know what's, what's, what's the size of this. Now. Um, you might imagine if you've been to Costco or <coughs> Albertsons or many other places or even go to these uh, stores that sell Halloween candy, that there are a lot of M&Ms produced. This number is really, really big. So do you think you'd be able to know what this is? It would take a lot of effort to know what this is exactly, right? You'd have to measure every M&M. You'd weigh every M&M. Or would you know what this is? No. So, but you do want to know what it is. But, but actually, exact knowledge of this quantity or this quantity, in the case of M&Ms, would be uh, very difficult. In fact, it would be so difficult that you wouldn't be able to make a profit selling M&Ms if you went to the effort of measuring these things. So what you do is you try to maybe take some representative sample of the M&Ms. Take maybe a handful uh, of them or a basketful and, and measure them and see, see what you get. And that's what uh, we do in statistics. Uh, and this is called sampling. You take some smaller subset of the whole population and try to make inferences about what this is and what this is using that subpopulation. Also, um, this happens every election cycle. You hear public opinion polls about uh, who's going to win an election. What do they do? Do they ask every person, in United, every voter in the United States what they're going to do in the election? No. That would, that would be uh, an enormous effort and very costly. Uh, rather than 
ask every voter, maybe a public opinion uh, company like, uh, survey company like Gallup or Reuters will call maybe 3,000 people instead of 3 million or 30 million. And then they'll maybe try to make inferences about what this true proportion is of people in favor of candidate A. And maybe even have some idea about the variation. OK. So before we talk about that, let me write down something else here. Um, so imagine we have then some population of size capital N and these measurements of the individuals in that population. Uh, there may be repetitions in this list. For example, if uh, I were to ask everybody in this room, um, how old are you? I might hear the number 19 more than once and the number 20 more than once and the number 21 more than once. Or if I were to measure the students in the university, I might and to the nearest inch, say, I might see six feet more than once. I might see five foot eight more than one time. I might see those numbers many, many times. So instead of, so what we do is we try to condense this list into a list of distinct numbers that appear here. Uh oh. Don't worry. So we'll let these be the distinct values that appear in this list of measurements. And a complete list. So that means every number that appears here appears here once and only once. So for example, um, in inches, let me suppose that the heights of the students in this room are uh, Let's see, uh, five feet is uh, 60 inches, so let me start with five, four, 64 inches, 64 inches, 65, 65, 65, 67, 68, uh, 68, 68, 68, 68, 68, 68, 69, 69, 70, 70, 70, 70, 72, 72, uh, 73, 74, 74, 74, 74. So suddenly we got a lot of tall people here. This would be, this is the list here of these numbers. That's the list of measurements of the individuals in the population. What would this list be? The yeah, the different values. So we say C1 is 64, C2 is 65, C3 is 67, C4 is 68, C5 is 69, C sub 6 is 70, C sub 7 is 72, C sub 8 is 73, C sub 9 is 74. So uh, last time I said these Greek letters, people were wondering, what is that? That's a Greek letter. It's a Greek letter. Let's see, I don't know if that, I don't think that's the one corresponding to S. I think the one corresponding to S is sigma. 
I'm not sure what this one corresponds to. But that's the Greek letter C. Now, in this example of the heights, uh, we could compute this number, right? This add up all those numbers and divide by the population size. And the population size there is how many numbers are on that list? Twenty five? Yeah. So we bring it. So in that example, capital N is twenty five. <laughs> and we'd get that the sample mean is one over twenty five times uh, sixty four plus sixty four plus don't worry, I'm not gonna write this all down. <laughs> sixty five. Uh, just a few of them. There are 474s? Yeah. Okay. It would look like that. Right? That would be how I'd write down the population mean in terms of the X, little xi's. But I could also do it in using uh, these numbers. It's also equal to 1 over 25. This is it 25? Uh, how many times does 64 appear? Twice. Twice. So it'd be 2 times C1, right? And then 65 appeared 3 times. So it'd be 3 times C2 plus da da da. And then plus 4 times C4. So what I do here is I take the number that, first number that appears, maybe the smallest one, and I multiply by the number of times it appears on the list. And then I take the next smallest one, multiply by the number of times it appears on the list, et cetera. <clears throat> so it's interesting to know what these numbers are. Let me define then n sub j to be the number of indices i, or individuals in the population, such that the value assigned to the individual i is c sub j. So in this example, N1 is 2, the number of times C1 appears. That is, the number of times 64 appears on the list is 2. N2, how many individuals have 65 as their height? It would be 3. N4 would be, oh, I'm sorry, I jumped to N3. N3, that the third value is 67. Only one individual has that. N4. One, two, three, four, five, six people have 68, etc. Okay, so I could rewrite this sum here as well. I'm going to call this one over capital N again, and the summation i equal one to r n sub j times c sub j. Right is N1 times C1, N2 times C2. Is, is that the summation where J is equal to 1? Oh, I'm sorry, J. Yeah, thank you. And R is the total number of distinct numbers on the list. OK, so let me write that over here. We could also write the population mean It's just, you just collapse this sum. You take all the numbers that agree with x1, group them together. Maybe there are n1 of them. Their common value is c1. You multiply n1 times c1. And you go and find the next value that you haven't already used. You group all the ones together that have this common value. There are n2 of them. Multiply n2 times c2, et cetera. Okay? Between hmm. X, hmm. so obviously there's more, hmm. take more 
I is bigger, I guess, right then. Capital N will be bigger than R or equal right. to little r. So we're by relation between n and x or anything like that? Or no? um, not yet. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> In the dichotomous case, uh, that's where the xi's are 0 or 1. What's little r? How many distinct Two. values do you have? Two. You just have two distinct values, right? And so C1 would be 0. C2 would be 1. So R is 2. N1 N1 and N2 can be expressed how? How many times does 1 appear on this list? If we know this value, can we tell what n2 is? Yeah. This number here would be, this number here is what in terms of n1 and n2? This is 1 how many times? n sub 2 times. This is 1 n sub 2 times. It's 0 all the other times. So if we add them all up, what do we get? What's this? This is n sub 2 here. So p is uh, n sub 2 over n, capital N. So n sub 2 is p times capital N. All right? And this, this sum would be n sub 2. This, is, this term is 1 how many times? n sub 2 times. That's, that's what n sub 2 is. It's the number of times that 1 appears on the list. And other times, this is 0. So if we add up all those numbers, we just get 1 every time there's a value 1 and 0 otherwise. So we get how many 1s? n2 1s. So this would be n2. So p is n2 over n. So n2 is p times n. Okay. And then what would this be? Capital N times. Yeah. So these add up to what number? N. Capital N. So this would be capital N minus p capital N, or 1 minus p capital N. OK. <clears throat> now we can also um, Try to express the variance using these numbers, the C's. Okay. We can express the population variance using numbers. To do that, let me first um, simplify this a bit. <laughs> if I expand the square, I would get this. And now I'm going to split up this sum into the sum of the xi squares, the sum of this stuff, and the sum of this stuff. Okay. Now in the second sum, neither the mu nor the 2 depend on i, so I can pull that out. And here, uh, this doesn't depend on i at all. It's the same term every time, and I add it up that many times. So that means I get this times that, capital N times mu squared. But then we divide by capital N, so this just becomes mu squared.
And now what is this thing here? That's mu. That's mu, isn't it? Isn't that mu? So this is mu. And here's 2 times mu with a minus sign. So this is minus 2 mu squared. Plus mu squared is minus, minus mu squared, right? So this is another way of writing the population variance. This is, this is like our uh, other formula. The variance of something is the second moment minus the first moment squared, right? That's all, that's all this is saying. Now this one we've already expressed using the numbers ni and ci. What about this? Well, how many times does xi squared appear on the, I mean, how many times does one of these numbers appear on the list? Well, we can use these things, right? So using those numbers, this would be, well, let's see. First we get cap, 1 over capital N, then the sum j equal 1 to r. Uh, we get the number squared, cj squared, times the number of times it appears on the list, and then minus uh, mu squared. So that'd be um, 1 over capital N sum j equal 1 to little r c sub j times n sub j. And this is squared. See that in the back? Okay, uh, so in the end we get sigma squared is 1 over n And reversing the steps, we can get it back to this. This is sort of like the going from the first line to the this thing, but in reverse. Let's let's check this. Let's check that this is actually equal to that. How did we go from there to here? We expanded the square, right? So what would the R here. This thing it would be this, right? What happens when we add up this squared times this? That gives us this term. Okay. What happens when we add up the CJ times the NJ? 
we get minus 2 mu squared when we divide by the 1 over n, right? And then here we get a plus mu squared. So we get a minus 2 mu squared plus mu squared. That's minus mu squared, which is what you get here. I mean here, sorry, minus mu squared. Okay. So maybe uh, just to carry it out one to make sure. This is the second term. When I add up this times this, I get that, right? And then I add up mu squared times nj, j equal 1 to r. What does that give? What if I add up nj, j equal 1 to r? What do we get? What's the sum? j equal 1 to r of nj. What's n sub 1? That's the number of times that the value C1 appeared on the list. What? Capital That's capital N. Right? N1 is the number of times the value C1 appears on the list. N2 is the number of times the value C2 appears on the list. So this is just counting how many times the numbers appear on the list. So if we add them all up, that would be the total number in the population. This is capital N. So when we add up. <coughs> mu squared times n sub j from here to here, that just gives us capital N times mu squared. But then we divide by capital N, that gives mu squared. Okay, and what's this thing here? That's mu again. So we get this thing minus mu squared. Here's minus 2 mu squared plus mu squared, which is what we have here. So here's a way to express the population variance using the numbers cj and nj. So those are the population, these are called the population parameters. So we won't, we won't uh, measure exactly the values in the whole population. We'll just uh, take a smaller part of the population and try to come up with some, using the data that we gather, try to estimate mu, tau, and sigma squared.
So this might mean, in the case of M&Ms, we take a bucket full of M&Ms that are coming off the production line and then measure them. So we select them at random, maybe. So let x1, x2, through xn be the result thing measurements. of n individuals selected randomly from the population. without replacement. So that means uh, in the case of students, you uh, maybe go to the inner circle and grab 50 students and measure their heights. But you don't grab them and then release them and then grab another one, because you might get the same one again. So we're going to, in this, uh, we will sample different individuals. Okay, we won't sample the same individual twice. That's what without replacement means. Okay. So you reach in and grab a bunch of students and pull them out, and that's, okay. You don't reach in twice. And so we treat these as random variables. The randomness is in the selection procedure. So if we were to do this in this room, maybe I uh, pick five people at random, uh, maybe uh, tr Richard, or Yao, or Carla, or Michelle, and Elliot, Elliot, right? No. Oh, sorry. Darren. Darren. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Ruined my day. <laughs> sorry. Darren. Okay, so I measure you five, and it I, I gives me X, capital X1 through capital X5, right? Or I might uh, measure Prega, David, um, uh, I, I want to, Brandon, Josh. And um, I Noble, <laughs> Eduardo. Okay, <laughs> and I get five different random, five different measurements, right? Or I might pick five different people. So the randomness is in the selection procedure. What I get here depends on which individuals are selection, selected, and then that's random. So any choice of n individuals is as likely as any other choice of little n individuals. Okay, so uh, under that assumption, what's the probability that the jth individual I measure, or let's say the ith individual I measure, or sample, has a measurement C sub j? Yeah, how many ever different values there are of that divided by the total number of values. Okay. How about the joint distribution? Uh, can I change this to K here? I'm going to use a J for index for the X's and K's and L's for the C's. Uh, what's the question again? K would be like the R in that summation of the right? Or not? Here? Yeah, right. Uh, this K? Yes. No, this is just one of the, well, you mean, you can make a, you mean change this to a K? Negative. What, what I meant is mm -hmm. we have R mm -hmm. of these values, yeah. right? Yeah, we have R distinct values. Is that not what we're saying that we have? We have how many of these values? 
this many, right? So the probability that the ith individual that I sample has that value would be just a proportion of that, of the values in the population, of those values in the population. What about this? Do you think xi and xj are independent? No. If you don't think they're independent, then we should try to compute this using conditional probabilities. Right? This is the definition, more or less, of conditional probability. So let's try to compute this. That's a terrible one. Well, it turns out this is different depending on whether k and l are the same and whether they're different. Let's consider the case where they're the same. What's the probability that? This one is CK if we know that this one is also CK. So you know that one, C, one of individual in the population with this value, CK, has been withdrawn from the population already, and now you're sampling again. What's the probability you get the value of CK if you took one individual out that had the value of CK? Yeah, and there are now this many <laughs> remaining with the value of CK, and we're drawing from what size population? Capital N minus one, right? If CK has been picked out already, one CK has been picked out already, there's one less, and we're, there's one less individual in the population too, so this is the probability now of getting a CK the second time if you got a CK the other time. And what if they're different? How many CKs are remaining if we picked out a CL and L is different? Yeah, we still have NK, but how many are in the population? Well, one has been picked out, so capital N minus one. So to continue with a joint distribution, Now, we just computed what the um, conditional probability is. What's that probability there? That's little nl over capital N, right? So we multiply this by capital NL over capital N. But this is a case where k is equal to L. So little nl over capital N would be little nk over capital N. So here we get nk minus 1 over capital N minus 1 times nk over capital N if k is L. If k is different from L, the conditional probability is this, and the probability that xj is CL is nl over capital N. So this is a case where k and L are different. So are they independent? Um, if they were independent, what would this be? If, this, if they were independent, this would be NK over capital N times NL over capital N, right? Yeah. If independent. Is that what we see here? No. It's not, that's not equal to the circle item there. So the random sample, the 
random variables in this random sample are not independent. This is a big difference between independent random variables and sampling. So you have to make adjustments for the fact that these are not independent random variables. If you have independent random variables, I want to emphasize this is if, I'm not saying that these are, but if x1 The variance of x bar is what? Now, if we're taking the variance of a multiple of a random variable, what do we do with that multiple? Square. It's square and take it out, right? And the variance of a sum of independent random variables is the sum of the variances. And each of these would be this, let's say they're independent, identically distributed. These, uh, these random variables have the same distribution. That's that line up there, right? Does that depend on i? No, that means they have the same distribution for all i, right? So they're identically distributed, but they're not independent. If they're independent and identically distributed, then this number would be sigma squared for every i. We add it up that many times, so we get n times sigma squared. Divide by n squared, we get sigma squared over n. Okay. We don't expect that for this case. That won't be the case for this type of sampling. And by the way, this is called simple random sample. Where you select individuals randomly and without replacement. Okay, so let's take a break. We'll come back and uh, <coughs> see what the variance of x bar is for a simple random sample. Okay, so let's try to compute the variance of x bar for a simple random sample. It's probably easier to see. Okay, so again, And from last uh, term,
we saw that generally the variance of a sum is the sum of these covariances. And remember, covariance of xi, xj is expected value of xi times xj minus the expected value of xi times the expected value of xj. So we should compute the covariances here. Now, um, it's a little different when i and j are the same and when they're different. So I'll split this into two sums, one where i and j are equal. And then if I have covariance of xi, xi, that's be the variance, right? Can you usually come up with the equal case on the, from a more general or the different case, or that's not always true? Uh, so Seems to me like the, the yeah. i is equal to j is a little more specific and doesn't happen that often. Oh, right. Then you, yeah, you could do the case where i's i and j aren't. You don't assume anything about it, and then deduce what happens when i is equal to j. Yeah, yeah you you could do that. Yeah, yeah, you could do that. But um, the computation is a little bit different. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to split it up. Okay, so this is the sum i different from j, i and j going from 1 to n. So this is like the diagonal and the off-diagonal. If you think of the pairs, i comma j, where i and j go from 1 to n. So how many terms are in this sum? N. Yeah, how many terms are in this sum? I squared. n squared minus n, because how many terms were in this sum? n squared, right? i goes from 1 to n, j goes from 1 to n, so there are n squared terms here. There have to be n squared terms here still, and there are n there, so that have to be n squared minus n here. Okay? Now, we'll, we'll use this. Let's compute covariance of xi and xj. I just wrote that formula over there. I'll write it again. So I guess the first thing we're going to do is compute expected value of xi. And I erased it. But let me write down the PMF for xi again. This would be the sum over all the possible values that xi could assume. And those would be the c sub j. And you multiply cj times the probability that xi is equal to c sub j. Okay. And what is this equal to? And if I put the 1 over n outside, we get that. And what is that? That's mu. So expected value of xi is mu. Okay. For 
Yeah, and why would it be for NAI? Because this is true for NAI. Remember, they're identically distributed, so all have the same expected value. Let's also, while we're at it, compute the variance of xi. That'd be the, the uh, if you have a hundred hundred people, they, you'd say you talk about the average value, because there's no randomness there. It's just a hundred individuals, and you but just add up the values, divide by hundred. Would expect the value. Makes sense. Yeah. So now expectation means what's the randomness? It's in the selection procedure. Okay. So you you the randomness is in selecting the individuals. Okay, what about the variance of xi? We just found the expected value of xi is mu, so its square would be mu squared. And here, what do we do? We add up all the possible values, over all the possible values that xi squared could have. What are those? Well, that's this. And then multiply times the probability that xi assumes that value. And now we just put in n sub j over capital N here. I'll write it this way. And what's that? Mm -hmm. If you look back in your notes a little ways, you'll see it. I've erased it. It's over here. Maybe it's still here. Is it still here? Oh, yeah. <laughs> there it is. What this is mu. That's mu squared. Mu squared is there. What's this? Well, that's what you see in the first term. So this is. Sigma squared. The variance of xi is sigma squared. The expected value of xi is mu. Okay. All right. So um, let's return to this computation. So this is mu. This is mu. So we need to compute that. how you compute. Uh, here we have jointly distributed random variables. Their joint distribution is written up there. The expected value of the product would be, you just multiply the two values that they could have times the probability they take on those two values. All right, now if you look up there, you see that things are different when k is equal to l and when k is not equal to L, and we're summing over K and L here. So what should we do with this sum? Yeah, split it up into the case where K and L are the same and where they're different, because we're going to put substitute different values for this in, depending on whether K is L or not. So we split this into two sums.
And when they're equal, this would be probably, this would be CK squared. And then we write down the sum when they're different. Okay, and now let's go over here. Would that also be S sub L over the question? This section on the bottom, the very far right, up, right there. Yep. I could put L here, but this is where they're the same, so I wrote it as K. Okay. And I and J being messed up. Yeah, they're fixed. They're fixed. Okay. Later we're going to sum over I and J. Remember, we want uh, I. Well, we're, we're going to sum over. Remember, the variance of uh, X bar was. This is what we're trying to do, compute the variance of x bar. And it's this here, so we have to compute all these things. So this is the beginning of that computation. We did this and this. These are both mu. So now we have to compute this one. And then once we, do, once we compute this, we subtract mu squared. And then we're going to sum over all i and j. And that'll give us this, OK? So the first step will be, I mean, well, the first step was computing that, so. OK, so let's, uh, let's do, well, let's see, what, what should we do? We should substitute in the probabilities there. When they're equal, we get nk minus 1 over n minus capital N minus 1 and n sub k over capital N. they're different, we get the next line there, n sub k over capital N minus 1 times n sub L over capital N. That's a drum roll. Okay. So far so good? All we did was substitute the joint probabilities. Now. Um, In both these terms, I have this uh, a, capital N minus 1 and also a, well, I'll, I'll leave the capital N inside. Let me factor out the capital N minus 1. This is still just a covariance, right? Uh, no, this is just this part. Just oh. this part. We haven't yeah. subtracted this, okay? So I'm computing this part, okay? And now, uh, the, this term and this term are a little different. I mean, of course, here k and l are different. Here k and l are the same. But this one has a minus 1, and that one doesn't. So I'm going to separate that out, OK? I'm going to separate out the part that has a minus 1. That'll be, I'm going to write that first.
and then I'd have an NK over capital N, right? This one, this guy came out here. This part is here with a minus one times NK over N. So this is the part with a minus one here. Then I also have the other one without the minus one. But now, when I don't have that minus one there, what are these two, what are the terms in these sums look like? They're the same. I could combine them. Whoops. Like that. Because uh, here, do I re require k to be l or k to be different from l? No. But if I split it up into the sum where k is l and where k is different from l, what do I get? When k is l, I get ck, ck, that would be ck squared, and then nk times nk, nk times nk, the, right? And when k is different from l, that's exactly that. Remember the n minus 1 I factored out. You yeah, so I separated the numerator here into a minus one, and then I put the, the rest of it in with this sum. Why don't we have nk over n minus one? I put it out here. So you said... I factored, I factored this all the way out to here. This part came down here, and the rest of it... came here, okay? All right. Well, what's this thing? this, right? And what's this? This is mu squared. So this is sigma squared plus mu squared. This is sigma squared plus mu squared minus, it would be minus sigma squared minus mu squared. What don't you like about this expression? Or what, what would you like better here? This is nice. That's what, that's a probability. This is not a probability. It, it's lacking something. It's missing something. What does it need? It needs a capital N. But we want to keep our expression equal to what we started with, so what should I do? Multiply by capital N out here. All right, and so what do we have there? We have a sum that looks like this. We have a sum that looks like that, don't we? AK is CKNK over capital N. AL is CLNL over capital N. So we have a sum that looks like this, AK times AL, K and L go from one to N. 
that's equal to that. Why is that? Well, I can rewrite this as the sum k equal 1 to r a k times the sum l equal 1 to r a l. And how do you multiply two sums together? You have to multiply all the possible pairs together, from the one from the first, one from the second. If I pick one from the first, what would that be? That would be an a k. Pick one from the second, that would be a l, right? So what I get? I get the sum a k times a l. So a sum that looks like this is a square of a sum. So what is this? This is the sum k equal 1 to r c k n k over capital N. Squared, thank you. So what is this uh, in the end? Uh, what is that sum? That's mu, right? Is that right? Okay. Well, I have two mu squared terms, so I should combine them. Uh, what, what's the total coefficient of mu squared here then? Capital N minus 1, and what am I dividing by? Capital N minus 1. So capital N minus 1 divided by capital N minus 1 is 1. So how, how, what's the final outcome for the mu squared? squared? Just get mu squared, right? And then for the sigma squared, we get minus sigma squared over n minus 1. And to recall, what is that? That's expected value of xi, xj. Okay? Okay, now what were we trying to do? Let's look into history here. We were trying to compute this, and we split it up like that. This was mu squared, and we decided we had to compute that. So let's substitute in the values now. The first one is minus sigma squared over capital N minus 1 plus mu squared. That's what that is over there. And then this is mu. This is mu. Mu times mu is mu squared. So we subtract mu squared. Mu squareds cancel. And we conclude that the covariance of xi, xj is minus sigma squared over capital N minus 1. And uh, what did we decide the variance of xi was? Right. So let's think about this 
for a moment. What does this mean? If xi and xj are independent, what's the covariance? Zero. It's not zero. This is an expression of how dependent they are. Uh, how does the covariance depend on the population size? As the population size gets bigger, the covariance gets smaller. So they become more like independent random variables when they have a big population. Okay. It becomes a smaller magnitude, but because it's negative. Yeah, now why is it negative? Yeah, if you pull one value out, is it likely you'll get that, is it more likely or less likely you'll get that value again? Yes. Less likely. So they're kind of negatively correlated. So the smaller so the population, the smaller. The, big, the smaller the population, the more dependent they become. But the whole covariance but if is the small, right? As no, if, if capital N is big, this number will be small in absolute value. But the covariance is big. Well, no, for a fixed, if you fix a sigma squared, for a fixed value of sigma squared, if the population gets bigger, the dependence between xi and xj gets smaller. Because okay. this number gets smaller when, with capital N getting big. So I'm looking like a negative 100. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of like this. Uh, suppose you're, um, you're, you're growing salmon in a, you know, they put barges out in the ocean. I think they do this in Scotland. How do they farm salmon? They have a bunch of salmon in a big barge. You know what a barge is, right? And suppose you want to measure the size of a typical salmon in that barge. Well, the population, capital N would be the number of salmon in there, right? And if you pick out 10 salmon from there without replacement, um, there, there will be some correlation between their sizes. It will be the related to the variance and how big the population is. Now it's, that's sampling without replacement. Now let's suppose we do this with salmon in the ocean. This is a very, very big number. And let's consider the difference between sampling with replacement and sampling without replacement. So what would sampling with replacement mean? You catch a fish, you catch a salmon, measure it, throw it back in, and now you catch another one. How likely is it you'll catch the same one? Fairly unlikely, right? Because there's so many salmon. So sampling with replacement and without replacement become very similar when the population size is enormous. And this is kind of expressing that. If, they're, if you're sampling with replacement, the random variables are independent. This would be zero. If you're sampling without replacement, there's a slight dependence, and it depends on the population size. But if you consider maybe something like sampling salmon from the ocean or some other population where the numbers are enormous, sampling with or without replacement is nearly the same. But when the population size is, say, a couple hundred, this could be some significant, this could make some difference here. Okay, so now let's try to recall what we were trying to do. We were trying to compute the variance of x bar. So we have to put in the values here. Okay, now the variance of xi is sigma squared. What happens to the negative um, variance over mx1? The final point? You know how it's the covariance of xi? Oh, yeah. So, well, we haven't put in the covariance. We oh. haven't put the value in yet. 
Okay, so I'm gonna, next step will be, a, oh. for this I'll put that in, okay? So I just, so far I just wrote out that the variance of x bar is this, but now I split this up when i and a are the same and when they're different, these things will have different values, okay? When i is equal to j, I get the variance of xi. When i is different from j, I get the covariance for different random variables xi and xj, okay? Now we'll substitute in the values. This is sigma squared. How many times do I add that up? N times, and I divide by N squared, so that'd be sigma squared over N, that's the first term. Second one, now um, I have an N squared here. All these things are the same. Okay, all of those terms are the same, minus sigma squared over capital N minus one. How many times do I add that in? N squared minus N. Because there were N squared terms all together to begin with. N of them I separated out, so there must be little N squared minus little N left. Now all we have to do is uh, simplify. Well, there's a sigma squared I can factor out. Then I get one over little N. Here I'd get, uh, uh, what, 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 um, plus, uh, one minus one over, well, no. How am I gonna do this? Um, min, uh, this is a minus sign, minus, minus, minus. Little n, little n minus one over, uh, I think you get that, is that right? This comes here. Uh, this is little n times little n minus one, but one power cancels with the, the square down here. Now I'm gonna factor out the little n. I get one minus little n minus one over capital N minus one. Okay, so that's it. The variance of x bar is the population variance over little n, and then one minus little n minus one over capital N minus one. Now, you could also uh, combine this into one fraction. The denominator would be capital N minus one which means we express this as capital N minus one over capital N minus one. Then we subtract this. When I subtract a minus one, that becomes plus one. So I get capital N minus little n here. That's another way to express the variance of x bar. Okay, so this is for simple random sampling. What did we get when uh, the x's were independent? We got this, this is what you get when the xi's are independent. When they're from simple random sampling, there's this factor that has to be multiplied by that, okay? And again, if uh, the sample size over the population size is really, really small, suppose that we're um, maybe, suppose there are 30 million Vote, let's say there are, how many voters do you think that, how many people vote in the presidential election? Is it 50 million, 60 million, do you know? Eligible voters or what? No, who actually vote? Um, is it 50 million, 60 million? And a population, so um, suppose you sampled 1,000 voters uh, for their opinion, little n is 1,000, capital N is 60 million, 1,000 over 60 million is, is that 10 to the three over six times 10 to the, Six, so that'd be uh, like one, one over six thousand. That's one, one minus one over six thousand is about what? Point nine nine. Point nine nine nine. Does nine 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 sound familiar to you? Do you remember that? <laughs> so this would be almost one. So a lot of times you could ignore this if this fraction is really small. 
But sometimes this fraction isn't all that small and you have to put it in. Mm. Okay? So that's the variance of x bar. When you say the fraction is small, you mean the fraction is close to 1? So this number would be close to 1. Oh, that okay. fraction is small. That number is close to 1. Okay. Okay. So um, now uh, we want to do things like find confidence intervals from u. So we're going to use central limit theorem. So let's review that for a moment. This is the central limit theorem. X bar is what? It's the average of these. You add up x1 through xn, divide by n. Subtract the mean, divide by this factor, and you get approximately normal. Now this factor is sigma over root n. is the square root of the variance of x bar. This is the independent case, right? In the independent case, the variance of x bar is that. So in other words, we could rewrite this as x bar minus mu over square root of the variance of x bar is approximately normally distributed with large n. large enough sample size, okay? The same thing is true over here in this dependent case. The dep when capital N, when little n over capital N is small, central limit theorem still holds. So if uh, z of alpha is the 
number which satisfies This relation, the probability that a normal random variable with mean zero minus one is bigger than that is equal to alpha. In other words, the area under the graph of the density for the normal with mean zero minus one to the right of z of alpha is alpha. Then This probability equal? What's the probability being in here? That's what this is saying. What's the area under the graph here? Yeah, what's the area to the right of this point? Alpha, alpha over 2, right? What's the area to the left of this point? Alpha, alpha over 2. So what's the area outside of that interval? Alpha. alpha, so the area of the shaded region here is 1 minus alpha. Okay, so we'll stop there. I'll, I'll continue this next time. But what, what's going to happen? Um, we want to find... We're going to use x bar to estimate mu. Now we know that this expression is nearly normal, but do we know what this is? What is, what is variance of x bar? What's the variance of x bar? Sigma squared. We know, we know this, this, this. We don't know that. So we have to use a sample to estimate this. Okay, so we'll use the central limit theorem, but we can't put this in there because we don't know what it is. You can't use something you don't know. Can you? Sometimes. Sometimes. But this time, no. <laughs> okay, so we had to find a way to estimate, find an unbiased estimator for variance of x bar. And then we'll put that in here.